Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today it's time to have a look at an interview which the CEO of Gaijin Entertainment did, Anton Yudinsev, and it's basically talking about War Thunder, the future of it, and there are some little tidbits here which I think are worth going over. So if you don't know who Anton is, as I said, he's the CEO, uh, he's actually been on a few live streams. Uh, the one I remember is, I believe it was 2017, uh, where he was on the live stream doing a Q&A with Fly, and also uh, he's done a few videos videos as well in the past, and it is uh, quite vocal, or at least used to be vocal, on answering stuff uh, through Reddit before people started leaking his personal messages, and therefore, obviously, <laughs> yeah, after that, you can understand why somebody would just walk away, because dealing with stuff like that, or dealing with people who do that, is completely pointless to the individual. Anyway, here are some pictures of Anton, if you don't know what he looks like. Uh, you can see Anton and his twin brother, Kirill. Uh, Kirill is, I believe, the chief head designer, or basically the head of development uh, over at Gaijin. So you've got the CEO and then the, you know, another big brass. And they both look very similar, as I said, twins. Here is uh, Anton himself with a Che Guevara shirt on, which has the Gaijin emblem on it. Uh, <laughs> I've actually talked... <laughs> <laughs> I actually talked to um the uh some of the Gaijin guys about like Gaijin merchandise. Like do they have like a store or a shop or anything? And they keep saying that, you know, they'll probably set one up, but there's some weird and wonderful like <laughs> shirts and stuff like that out there. And this is one of them, you know. It <laughs> <laughs> it's the Gaijin emblem on Che Guevara. That's so odd to me, knowing the history. And then here's a picture of him uh, at some kind of Gamescom with Kirill alongside some itty-bitty titties in a sports car. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's just, it's a wonderful, wonderful world we live in, isn't it? Anyway, let's get to the questions and the answers. So perhaps the thing War Thunder gets praised most for, above all else, is the game's clear love for its literally thousands of aircraft, tanks, and ships, which are all designed so well it is, uh, is it fair to say that that is an area of passion for you as developers as well? It's definitely our passion, and most of our development team were born and raised in the Soviet Union, and we knew about World War II and the victory from the very childhood. Most of us have grandparents or great-grandparents who fought in World War II. We admire and respect what they've done, and we've always been and we've been always interested in the history and vehicles of World War II and later. The thing is, uh, I definitely found this, especially in Britain as well. Uh, you are taught from a young age about World War II and also about the First World War. You are taught about the good stuff. You are taught about the bad stuff. And generally, you will have family members who fought in World War II. Uh, so for me, uh, I was fortunate. My granddad was too young, and my great-granddad uh, was uh, too old to be able to fight. But instead, my great-granddad drove uh, transport trains all around Europe for the British. Uh, so that was his job in the war. And, you know, he, my granddad used to tell uh, me about, you know, what my great-granddad used to do. So there's definitely a link there for a lot of people in, you know, Europe and around there. Pretty much every family was affected by the war, uh, unless, obviously, you come in afterwards. So, yeah, it's it's going to be a passion for people, and I think if you're going to create something like War Thunder, you've, do you've definitely got to be passionate. It's a lot of work, uh, you know, just to create something on the size of what War Thunder is now. There is no shortage of content in War Thunder right now, but do you have plans for any major content lineup by way of post-launch support? Hmm. Major content updates happen in War Thunder every two to three months, and each of them brings dozens of new vehicles and adds new maps and new mechanics. In 2018, we had five major updates, which included the release on Xbox One, Naval Battles Open Beta Launch, addition of helicopters, supersonic jets, and many more. We plan to have 2019 fully packed with new content and features as well. There definitely was a ton of content last year, <clears throat> but as I've said in the past and will say today, we have a situation where uh, you have little uh, bits of content. So, yes, supersonic jets were added. Two of them. Yes, <laughs> helicopters were added. Three trees, and a lot of the vehicles are very similar in those trees. Yes, you had naval, uh, naval stuff added uh, with four trees, which is probably the most complete out of the other stuff. So, 
The thing is, yes, we had five major updates, we had a bunch of stuff added, but as I definitely believe this year, it is time to hone in and complete the things that have been started instead of expanding and expanding and expanding and sat in a situation where you have a bunch of really interesting mechanics, but they're all over the place and it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Some players often say that the economy in War Thunder can be a little grindy. Is that something that you feel is simply a byproduct of being a free-to-play title, or are there perhaps other free-to-play games that you're always looking at to improve War Thunder in similar areas as well? We've been adding new content to the same to the game since its launch, and we are regularly I hate that word, uh, adopting the game economy to the new conditions. In both 2017 and 2018, we have only decreased total time needed in game to unlock each vehicle, but by lower, but by low, th- uh, but both, by both lowering, I don't know why I'm struggling today, really lowering requirements and increasing gains. War Thunder is a unique game, and there are no titles on the markets which uh, we just copy in terms of progression system. So this is interesting. November 2017 was the big research drop uh, when we got a lot of vehicles from top to uh, which went from like 210k to 120, 380k to 210. You know, there, there was a ton of stuff which has dropped down. But now we are in a situation today where we have more top tier vehicles which are at that 380k mark than we did before. In my opinion, there is definitely a shout uh, for dropping some of these vehicles. It is very obvious which is meta at top tier and which is not. The MBTs are very much meta, everything else uh, comes behind, but they come behind in varying degrees. So uh, in that case, we should lessen the research on the vehicles which aren't used that much, and therefore try and promote people using them, instead of people just going straight for the Abrams, or straight for the uh, T7, uh, the T80. Because if you do that, then what you end up with is you don't end up with a balanced lineup. You just end with one top tier tank and that's it. And that isn't healthy for the game and it's not healthy for the individual either because they get that top tier tank and they're like, well, why aren't I doing so well? You know, why? Where's my support? Where's my helicopter? Where's my, uh, you know, AA? Where's my scout vehicle? And it's like, well, you decided to chuck everything into this one vehicle instead of trying to, you know, split it across the place. For me personally, I what I like to do is I like to grind out a whole lineup before I start playing it. So let's say, uh, uh, well, like Italy is a great example, right? So before uh, the OF40 was an NATO. And the uh, the their AA the sedan uh, sidam or whatever it is uh, that was a dado and so for me I would like to grind out that and the the sedan and the OF40 before I actually start playing that. So I have a backup vehicle to what I was using, and now the Centauro is the same deal. So I, uh, for me, that's how I get past it, and once I hit that brick wall at rank 6, I can't do that anymore, because it's just not feasible. Uh, they also decreased re- repair uh, parts and FPE in 2018, but I can't remember them reducing any research costs in 2018. And if they did, it will have been an early... 2018 but the big one was in 2017 i think personally yes uh, top tier there are issues at every other tier it's fine when it comes to research and uh, also comparing war thunder models to some other games uh, such as mmos it ain't that bad but there there's still in my opinion a problem with top tier ground vehicles everything else is okay oh also some of the naval vehicles it's kind of crazy like i can grind out th- uh, four destroyers or one pt boat i understand that you know that's how the tree is set up but there has to be some thoughts about this and i might make an individual video about that how do you achieve the balance of being able to appease both hardcore simulation enthusiasts as well as more casual minded looking for a more accessible experience War Thunder's success started with our invention of mouse aim controls, which opened the skies for millions of relatively casual players who hadn't had flight sticks, but were eager to take themselves to the skies. 
For all types of vehicles, we provide players with three different levels of difficulty in the battles, Arcade Realistic Simulation. The War Thunder's arcade mode is more realistic than most of the other arcade games on the market, it still has quite a low entry threshold, and at the same time, it doesn't completely sacrifice vehicles' physics simulation. Arcade mode invites war games uh, enthusiasts to try a more realistic approach. While they can still be efficient in battles and have fun without long training in advance, and we can see an ongoing migration of players from arcade mode to realistic battles and further to simulation. This is completely true. One of the things that, for me at least, was great about War Thunder when I started was I was playing on a pretty bad laptop. I had no money. Uh, I didn't have a joystick or anything like this. I enjoyed flight sims when I was smaller, you know, when I was a kid. But once I moved to Canada, I didn't have all of those things, you know. They were all sat at home. So for me, having uh, for me having a game which I, you know, uh, emulated the stuff that I enjoyed when I was younger and also had this idea of mouse aim was revolutionary. It, it meant that I could play it and have fun and really enjoy my time. And it, the barrier of entry was very, very low. Now, obviously, nowadays, uh, you know, I have a joystick, I have a mouse. I enjoy both ways of playing. And uh, it definitely does appease, I would say, 95% of people with uh, what it does. I think the hardcore, hardcore simulator guys, there are better games out there, uh, such as the Battle of Stalingrad stuff. But uh, in order for War Thunder to ever get on that level... It would have to expand so much that I don't think it would even be worth it, like, for the amount of players that you get. Like, one of the things, uh, a lot of the time we talk about competitors, right, to War Thunder, and uh, Battle of Stalingrad always gets uh, brought up. IL-2 Battle of Stalingrad, I should say. Go and look at the player base uh, that is on that. Actually, I'll do it for you now, uh, just so... Yeah, so we can go on Steam Chats, right? And uh, if we go on aisle two, like this, oh, maybe not, <laughs> like this, maybe, is that better for you? There we go. So you can see that IL two, Battle of Stalingrad, one of the big competitors to War Thunder, has 24 hour peak of uh, 304 people. Now, all time peak of 544. Now, this is still a very heavy simulator game. It has a very high bar to entry, but generally it is seen as a competitor to War Thunder. And War Thunder, and this is just on Steam, right now has a 24 hour peak of 15,817 people. It is not in the same league, is it? At all. So it, it's very hard to make the comparison. And I don't blame War Thunder for not going for more of that realistic simulator experience, because there is a hardcore community there, but it isn't very big. And when you're trying to create a, fle a free-to-play game, you want to have the biggest market, market possible. What is the biggest change that you feel you've implemented in War Thunder since the very first days of its availability? The biggest change happened with the addition of ground forces. It not only brought a new type of vehicle to the vehicles to the game, but created a completely new type of battles, combined ones, which added a great variety of tactics. Players need to decide whether they want to focus on capturing the bases on the ground, make a quick aerial attack to stop enemy offensive, jump to a SBAAG to cover their teammates from attacks from above, and a lot more. And all of that in, is in constantly changing conditions on the battlefield. At the same time, this complex gameplay needed to be well balanced. There was a huge job done on our side, and that was completely worth it, because War Thunder Combined Battles is the feature that gives players unique battle experience. I remember that uh, War Thunder hits 100,000 uh, players online. And this was, I think, about a month after Ground Forces OBT came out. 
And it was very obvious to me that Ground Forces was a big switch in, you know, where War Thunder was going to go. And nowadays, Ground Forces is the most popular game mode. And then it goes Air, and then it goes Naval. So it was incredible to see how much of an interest there was in Ground Forces. And yes, there was a lot of issues in the early days, you know, with certain bugs and things. But I think nowadays it works pretty well, you know. Uh, the whole thing works all right, and uh, I think, if I remember, we're coming up on the fifth year anniversary of War Thunder Ground Forces coming out, which is kind of weird when you see it like that. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely an interesting thing to think of. But yeah, I, I would agree, it definitely revolutionized the game uh, from a player-based point of view and from a mechanical point of view. Are there any major changes that you have your eyes on in the foreseeable future? We have many big updates and improvements planned for the near future. A constantly expanding army of modern ground forces and aircraft brings new gameplay and tactics with the new types of armament and new technologies, like controlled missiles, radio location systems, and others. There's much more to come. Stay tuned. Okay. Radio location systems, so radar, basically. So we're going, well, I mean, it might be talking about uh, the revolution of Radar Guided AA, because they did talk about how in a Q&A they want to change it. They want to make it uh, different. So it might be talking about that. It might be talking about actual radar from actual aircraft or, uh, you know, machines on the ground. Controlled missiles, uh, we already have, but there's definitely going to be an expansion of it. Two uh, air-to-air missiles were just added to the files, which were uh, only present on the MiG-21. Uh, so you can definitely see we're getting an expansion of those systems. For me, uh, I would love to see some kind of SAM technology, but if we are, once again, going more modern with all of this stuff, uh, research costs have to be reduced. Not for anything else, uh, but just for ground vehicles top tier, and not even for all vehicles, just some of the ones which aren't used that much. Are there any major uh, changes that you have? Uh, I've just read that. Do you have any plans for releasing War Thunder on the Switch? The Nintendo Switch is an interesting platform. We have our SDK and development kits, and we are currently testing various technical solutions of porting War Thunder's engine to this console. The Switch? I don't think the Switch has a ton of power in it, does it? Uh, if I remember correctly, but I suppose uh, that Legend of Zelda game runs pretty well. Uh, I personally, when it comes to the Nintendo Switch, I don't know a ton about it. Uh, it just seems like a handheld console, which, you know, is one of uh, the best that's been made recently. But for me, I I have no interest in handheld stuff, you know. When, when I, you know, leave the house to go to work or when I go out to the shops or whatever it is, I don't need a handheld thing. And if I'm in, if I'm in my house and I want a game, you know, I've got my computer... Uh, I've got my phone if I wanted to do some stuff, but it's always a good thing to expand the options, you know, of War Thunder on different consoles uh, to increase player base, uh, let's say, and also give it to a wider community. you got to remember the Switch is very popular in areas like America and also Japan, and it could be a way of smashing a market which uh, was previously not seen. It also might be a huge waste of time, but then again, we'll see, right? <laughs> Uh, you recently called out Sony for not having enabled crossplay for War Thunder, in spite of the game being built with the feature in mind. Why do you think Sony have so far not budged on it, and is that something that can be frustrating? Uh, well, this is a bit of an odd question. First of all, Sony does have crossplay. Uh, they were the first in current generation to introduce it with PC. What they don't have is cross console play for most of the games yet. Sony seems to have some reasons for not launching cross-console play for everyone right now, and unfortunately, they don't share it with the public, so we are not aware of them. We hope that the latest interview at Game Informer means that the process of getting cross-play clearance is going to get faster. That's true. Uh, so, if you, um, well, I don't know if you uh, read this or not, but basically, uh, PlayStation... Uh, refuted the claim that they were blocking cross-platform play, right? 
and uh, <laughs> and basically some uh, games were allowed to do it, so Fortnite and Rocket League, and there was a list which was created of games which hopefully would get it soon, and I believe War Thunder was on that list. Now, the way it works right now is PS4 players can play with PC players, Xbox players can play with PC players, PC players can play with everybody, PS4 players can't play with Xbox players. Uh, that's the way it works. Now, uh, nobody really knows the reason why. What I've personally heard is that it is a fact that Sony cannot control uh, the... You know, if there is an issue on Xbox's end when it comes to uh, accounts or when it comes to moderation, uh, they cannot control that from their end and they're not happy with that. But the issue with that thought is that would be the same for PC. And they are fine with crossplay on PC. I just think it is generally just a, they're our competitor. We don't want to give them any leg up at all. And we want to win this, you know, console war or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the thing is, uh, I understand why War Thunder would want this. It's kind of like the market situation as well. Like a lot of people like shout at Gaijin uh, saying, you know, why isn't the market available for PS4? Or why isn't the Gaijin market available for Xbox? I bet you a thousand, maybe a million dollars that if they want it, if, if it was allowed by Sony and Microsoft, the market would have been there day one. Because why wouldn't it be? You know, what, what is the downside for Gaijin having that market there? Uh, you have uh, you have more demand for stuff, so the prices are probably going to be higher. You have more stuff being traded. It becomes a larger ecosystem and therefore more sustainable. Like there's a lot of stuff which makes it a lot better, but for some reason, you know, it's not allowed. Hopefully, in the future, it is just like the crossplay stuff. Uh, I personally don't see uh, an issue with this. I was a console gamer ages ago. The last console I had was an Xbox 360, so that'll give you an idea. And um, I I enjoyed, you know, playing on it, but I would never have any reservations with playing with other consoles or, you know, PCs and stuff. I think that would be good. More players is better. You know, more variety. Uh, do you believe crossplay is something that actively benefits any game? Crossplay is almost essential for multiplayer games, especially those with tier-based matchmaking. Splitting the audience between different platforms significantly increases the time players spend in a queue waiting for battle, and of course, crossplay lets you play with your friends on other platforms. Thus, you are having more fun and get to the battles faster. All of that is making the gaming experience better, so we are sure that full crossplay is the future of gaming. Some argue that it can put console players at a disadvantage, playing on gamepad versus playing with a mouse and keyboard in shooters. However, this argument is actually about crossplay with PC, which is already allowed by all platform holders, and its strength heavily depends on the game genre. Yes, I think that's true. I think there are definitely uh, advantages with using a keyboard and mouse over a gamepad. Uh, whenever somebody asks me, you know, uh, I I play on PS4 or I play on Xbox, would it be worth using a keyboard and mouse or a gamepad? I always say keyboard and mouse, uh, just because the get the aiming is better. And this is I have an Xbox 360 uh, wired controller, right? So uh, I, I I've tried joystick, I've tried gamepad, I've tried tried keyboard and if you play arcade or realistic you know mouse and keyboard is the way to go but uh inherent advantages i just i just think it means that you can be a bit more defined in what you're doing so uh, it means that you can be a bit more precise while you're shooting uh, while you're aiming and all of this stuff so it just makes it slightly easier uh, on everything and uh, i do think there is an advantage it's definitely not as big of an advantage compared to other games and it doesn't mean you can't have fun either there isn't really a competitive side of normal war thunder and what i mean by that is the average you know pvp matchmaking games you've obviously got squadron battles and tournaments and stuff but the main thing is, uh, you know, the average matchmaking, there's no MMR, there's no, uh, you know, ELO system or anything like that. So it is just kind of go in and have fun. This is why sometimes you have stomps uh, on one side and sometimes you don't. But yeah, it's it shouldn't really matter how good a person is as long as they're enjoying the game. That's the main thing, right? Next gen is coming sooner or later. From a development perspective, what is your biggest expectation from PS5 and Xbox Scarlet? 
I really those Xbox Scarlet is that what they're going with? Jesus Christ! I'm almost sure that cloud gaming will be available in the new generation of consoles. In that case, we should see cheaper consoles, which will open the world of console gaming for more players, and that's great for both players and game developers. Developers can be adding more high-tech graphics featuring、uh, features to their games, as cloud gaming will make it available for a wider audience,、uh, and and the same time. And the same time, okay. Usual, computing power leap is inevitable. The end of the current generation brought us 4K and 30 FPS with the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One X. So expect we will see more of it. Retail part of game distribution is already weak, which brings some challenge to platform holders in the next generation. Retail stores were not only getting their margin, but also provided visibility for games and consoles. That's true. Um, the Problem uh, that uh, the problem that、uh, consoles will always have is、uh, PCs. If you can get a PC at the same price as a console, which has very similar hardware, and also the PC can do a bunch more stuff, it's very hard to say let's get a console. Apart from exclusives, you know, if you really want to play God of War. You get a PlayStation because it's not available on anything else. But the thing is, at the end of the day, ninety percent, ninety-five percent, maybe even ninety-nine percent of games are available on all platforms now, because that means there's more of a market, you know, for the people making the game.、Uh, apart from some of the exclusives, so there's going to be a compu-、uh, computing power leap at some point. On top of this,、uh, that means that the lower end PCs will get cheaper. And unless consoles can compete, there is no real reason I can see to get a console. Like even from a point of like, oh well, let's get around the you know console、uh, in the living room. You know, we'll just stick a PC there instead. Yeah, like it. You know, okay, basically do the Steam Box idea instead of with the ridiculous Steam Box idea.、Uh, just get a PC. And then just you can access the Steam, you know, home family sharing thing. You can play all the games from there. If you have kids, they, you know, you can plug in controllers into that thing if they like that. You can plug in dance mats if you feel like it. VR stuff as well. Like, it's just it. The the problem that consoles have is that、uh, they are running out of games which are just on them. Right now, I think Red Dead is probably the biggest, and God of War. But hopefully, Red Dead will eventually come to PC. The cloud gaming idea is interesting. So I remember back in the day, there was these adverts called "What is cloud gaming?" and and then it gave you a spiel for about five minutes, which meant absolutely nothing. Like it, it was literally useless to my ears. <laughs> and but I think I understand what cloud gaming is nowadays. It's kind of like basically streaming gaming. Uh, so you know how I believe on Xbox and PlayStation they give you the option of signing up to a service where you can stream games from a server and you get a little bit of you know lag,、uh, maybe a second lag depending on your internet connection. But the idea is is you don't have to download it, you don't have to have it on your system, and therefore it saves space, therefore、uh, it saves computing power and makes it easier. You are basically streaming playing the game. Now the issue with this is the same issue that, in my opinion, stuff like Steam has, where it's literally you are buying stuff to play, but what happens if the servers go down, right? Now with Steam, this isn't a huge issue、uh, because it's very hard to see how it's going to fail. But with a system such as independent streaming, you know, services like、uh, cloud gaming, or if it isn't incorporated fully、uh, into the systems, you could put a lot of money into something, and then the games could disappear, or the system could disappear. So you're not really paying for anything; you're paying for、uh, a rental of a server to play a game. Now that, in my opinion, doesn't sound very good when you put it like that, does it? So the cost、uh, breakdown for me is not great.、Uh, but if if you want to play the games, I suppose at a higher FPS, you can do it.、Uh, you'd need a good internet connection, though.、Uh, but I suppose that is also getting better with time. The other thing,、uh, the last question. Is what is your take on the ongoing drama of loot boxes and microtransactions? 
Microtransactions and loot boxes have been in free-to-play games for at least a decade already, but have drawn so much attention only after they appeared in premium games in its worst case. The reason is obvious. Players are paying full price for a game already, and they feel cheated by having free-to-play monetization mechanics in addition, especially if such mechanics provide unfair advantages pay-to-win. The outcome was not good for the industry. Some countries even made unclear laws, which can basically equate all games with rewards, and not only those with loot boxes, but any in-game rewards with gambling. I would hope it will settle to more reasonable and clear rules on the market, but at the moment it has damaged the industry. This is the thing, right? So, normally what happens, uh, <laughs> normally what happens if you look through history, is uh, you have something coming to the market which is an innovation, somebody takes it too far and decides to try and milk people of money, then the government gets involved to regulate that thing, and normally they regulate it so it actually hurts the first guy who came up with the creation. Does that make sense? So it can have massive knock-on effects, and if you've actually looked into the laws of uh, Belgium, which I believe are the people who have... Uh, have limited it, same with the Netherlands, it doesn't clearly specify exactly what a loot box is and what the whole system is as well, because the system also, you know, also needs to be looked at. So because it doesn't fully specify it, uh, it means that it can be applied to other areas. And this is one of the problems that Europe uh, especially <laughs> is dealing with and other, play other places are as well. We're getting laws introduced, you know, 10, 15 years ago uh, for specific reasons. And then 10, 15 years later, what is happening is these same laws are used for different reasons, which may seem malicious uh, to the individual. So you could make a law which is like, I don't know, uh, something as simple, simple as don't kill babies, right? Uh, and obviously, uh, we're talking about, you know, born babies. Uh, so, you know, don't kill born babies. And uh, then 10 to 15 years down the line, people take this law and they, uh, the definition of kill has changed. Uh, so therefore, killing a baby is actually feeding it correctly, you know, something like that. So everybody who before saw this normal reasonable law now turns around and is uh, screwed by it uh, because the definition of specific words have changed. And so a lot of things are being taken from the past today, especially stuff like cu communication laws, uh, which are supposed to promote free dialogue and get rid of, uh, you know, actual hate speech, uh, if you believe in it. And the problem is, we're getting into a situation now where it seems like a lot of laws are being used maliciously to shut down some and not others. And, uh, you know, targeted, well, what would you call it? Targeted... Uh, use of them, I suppose, and I hope that this trend doesn't continue, and I feel like with this, uh, because of the fact that people like EA, people like Blizzard, have pushed the envelope and created really predatory systems when it comes to this loot box stuff, it's going to hurt everybody, even though, uh, you know, there's no, in, in War Thunder at least, uh, there is no uh, technical pay to win when it comes to loot boxes. You can argue about the vehicles that it gives, but all of them are vehicles which you could have got over time. You know, I've, I, a lot of the vehicles in the loot boxes I have because, you know, I did the events back in the day. So for me, it's uh, kind of sad to see everybody being lumped under the same umbrella, but that is basically how all of these things always work. Uh, so hopefully we, there is like a, <laughs> hopefully there is, a, uh, a solution to this. Uh, Gaijin themselves have already come up with one for the Netherlands and the uh, Belgium guys, which is great. But it's we'll have to see in the next few years, especially when America gets involved, because I know for a fact in America they're looking to create legislation for this stuff, what is going to happen. And I don't think it's going to be pretty for a lot of the gaming industry. Anyway, I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time.